Welcome. My name is Jessica Piombo. I'm an associate professor in the National Security Affairs Department at the Naval Postgraduate School. And I'm here to talk with you today um, about the basic drivers of, of Somali piracy, giving an overview of some of the basic geographic, uh, social, and political trends that gave rise to piracy in the early 2000s, and some of the major trends in piracy uh, after it arose. The goal of this is not to give you a comprehensive, uh, be-all, end-all picture of who the Somalis are, what Somalia is about but to try to provide a little bit of context for those of you who are less familiar with the Somali situation about some of the political and land-based challenges or contexts for the, the sea-based issue that, that many try to confront as, as they deal with piracy. Um, so one of the things that you would immediately want to think about regarding Somalia and Somali piracy and, and how do you address this, whether you are a non-governmental actor, a civilian governmental actor, an intergovernmental actor, a military actor, is scale. And so right here you're looking at two different maps of, of Africa. Um, one is a shadow of Somalia superimposed over the eastern seaboard of the United States. And the other is a, a common graphic, you can see many variants of this online, of the just geographic scale of Africa itself. So if you look at the one on the left, uh, the right, to start off with, um, people who are unfamiliar with Africa just do not realize how large of a continent it is. So that you, know, you could fit Europe, the United States, China, Alaska, um, with a little bit of uh, creative engineering, but you can basically superimpose those land masses over all of Africa. So when we say events in the Horn of Africa and then immediately jump to talking about South Africa, for instance, we're talking about vast differences. And on one level, the highest level, it's, it's almost um, wrong to think that you can say that there are common threads uh, that, that transcend the politics of, of all of these areas. At the same time, there are other aspects of, of politics and economics that unify uh, a group of countries and peoples in, in this larger spot. But practically, when we're thinking about responding to s Somali political situation or um, piracy, you want to think about that map on the left-hand side. When critics sort of talk about the, or if they say that the combined task forces that are attempting to maritime interdict are having no effect, which at this point not many people say, but th there is a sort of, there have been the task forces and yet piracy continues. Um, they're patrolling a, a, an area of, of, of sea that is the length of the eastern seaboard of the United States and there is little to no land-based support for the sea-based solution. When we talk about a lack of governance in Somalia, we're talking about, again, the, the scale of the region over which we're expecting a government to, to pro project its power is very, very large. When we talk about the fact that there are three distinct territorial regions within Somalia that govern themselves slightly differently. There's a, a northern, a north central, and a southern region. Um, each of those regions is, is larger than, than other countries, especially in Europe. So some of the scale of this problem um, of, and of why there's an, an international attempt which has, faces its own challenges and sort of misses a lot of the smaller ships is because it's just almost impossible to come at this with just a sea-based solution. But one of the things I'm going to talk with you about today is why it's so difficult to have a land-based solution to a, sort of a, a political and a social and economic crisis in Somalia. Looking just at the Horn of Africa, which is the region within which Somalia sits, one of its defining characteristics is that of diversity. The hu another one is the huge scale. Another one is the, the massively porous borders. And then the fact that there are long-standing multiple crises um, political, economic, and, and conflict-based. Out of all the regions of Africa, this is the one that is currently the most conflict-prone. So many of the endemic crises that have afflicted Western Africa have largely been settled by now. 
the southern Africa of civil wars, longstanding in Angola and Mozambique, have, have calmed down. Zimbabwe is still a conflict situation. But in the Horn of Africa, we have uh, sort of the Darfur conflict that is ongoing, the northern Uganda ongoing conflicts, the continued political instability and challenges to the central government or the would-be central government in Somalia. These then, you know, sort of starting from the bottom up, these multiple crises, crises of politics and conflict have created a, what seems like an endless state of humanitarian emergency in, in the Horn of Africa. And really, technically, you'd want to call these complex crises. And a complex crisis, crisis is when a natural uh, stressor, something like a drought or a flood, overlays with a political situation, like a war or an authoritarian regime that manipulates food assistance to create a, a disaster that is both man-made and naturally uh, instigated. So that's kind of what, when we say complex disaster, that, that's what we mean. Most of the Horn of Africa problems, and, and sort of from a humanitarian assistance standpoint, the crises that they respond to are these complex crises. But even if I'm going to sort of say that we can talk about the Horn of Africa in general terms, to some extent, even that is a bit of a fallacy. So if you take a look at some of these pictures, the kind of topmost central one is a, a superimposition of Djibouti versus Uganda. Djibouti is the smallest country in the region. It has um, a, a commercialized or increasingly commercially developed seaport. And it exports salt. And pretty much that's its economy. It's rocky, mountainous, sandy. Pumice stone is, is most of, of what's lying on top of the sand. The peoples living there are nomadic. There is no farming. There is no native industry. Um, it's a very poor country that had a civil war in the 1990s. Um, and it's, it's a rather desperate place to go to um, as an outsider, especially. Versus Uganda, which is lush, it's farmland. And this is not the northern part, which is a little bit more tropical, but that picture is from sort of the central to southern parts of Uganda. Um, rich cultivation, the, the, the deep, dark red earth of Africa that you stereotypically think about. Um, just a much better performing uh, country with a lot more diversity for its people. Um, you can find contrasts like this within countries, within northern to southern Sudan, within Ethiopia from the Central Highland Plateau to the outlying more arid regions, especially as they start to border in Somalia. Within Somalia, with, from the arid north to a small part in the southern part of the country, and there's actually a, a picture of that now in the, in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Um, sort of, not, that's not a, a, a variation between different regions of the country, but that's variations within the country. So while sort of the different countries have a lot of variations just geographically within themselves and then across countries, within the country, depending on what time of year you're trying to get around, you may be dealing with a hard-packed clay, uh, you know, dried out road like in the, 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 the one picture, or a road that has been washed out from, from rains and floods. And that, I believe, is, is the, same, um, the same road, just in different times of the year with different degrees, uh, in different parts of the road, different degrees of vegetation on it, and obviously different degrees of water. Um, another contrast, very important contrast in African politics, is this idea of rural versus urban that um, there are increasingly large urban populations that are increasingly disconnected from their rural, rural roots. Overall, Africa in the past has been much more um, rural than urban in terms of population densities. Several countries, such as South Africa and, and, and others, are seeing a slight majority of their population living in urban areas now. But in the Horn of Africa, there will be distinct differences between the urban populations and the rural, the rural populations in terms of access to political power, locations of conflict, access to economic resources. And again, that becomes something that's important. So one of these things that we think about when, when we're dealing with even a place, if we're taking it just down to Somalia, of, of we need to think about scale, the size of the area. We need to think about who's in the cities and who's not. 
what time of year is it? If you're, if for example, in in the game, you're proposing um, landing U.S. You know, U.S. or international troops, and having them try to capture some of the pirate cities. Well, then you need to pay attention. Is it a monsoon season, or is it a drought season? And that's because if it's a monsoon season, transportation is going to be a little bit difficult because roads may be washed out. But if it's the dry season, um, inserting and extracting soldiers becomes difficult because it raises dust clouds, which within three to 10 seconds will completely obscure the, the ground underneath which a helicopter is hovering, just as an example. Um, this porous borders, which is, is the, the general feature that I haven't talked about, kind of gets to the fact that uh, most of these countries uh, barely control their capitals, so they don't monitor their borders. And with historically nomadic populations, there's a long tradition of movement of peoples within and across these territories. Now, in the modern era, what that has done is it facilitates refugee flows out of Somalia into Kenya. It facilitates arms flows from Uganda into other parts, from Kenya up into other parts of, of, of the northern regions of the Horn of Africa. And basically, there's a history of people who move around, and it's very difficult to know who is where and, and who is legally in different areas, and then what they're carrying with them. And so that creates you know, some security challenges when you're thinking of that. If we want to think about who are the Somalis, then let's drill down and you know, get, get to Somalia itself. Well, here's a couple of pictures. Uh, one is a map, obviously. And the shaded pink area on that map is where the people who we call Somalis live within the Horn of Africa. Um, the upper right hand is a picture of Somalis in Maine. There are large Somali diaspora communities spread throughout the world. There are several in the United States. They're in other countries as well. And then the bottom right picture is a, um, a Somali community in the Ogaden region of Ethiopia. You know, those are Ethiopians, technically, but they are Somalis by, nation well, by ethnicity. By nationality, they are Ethiopians. So when we talk about Somalis, there's Somalis who live within the territory of Somalia. That's the, the, the span of land that basically looks like a seven on the uh, eastern coast of the Horn of Africa. But then there are Somalis who live in uh, Djibouti, who live in Ethiopia, and who live in Kenya. And so one of the characteristics of the Horn of Africa, when we think of it as a political and regional uh, complex, is that there are dimensions of Somali uh, secessionism in terms of does the Ogaden region of Ethiopia, that's the part of Ethiopia that sticks out into the Semen, do those Ogadenis want to leave Ethiopia and join Somalia? That's a perennial worry of Ethiopia that's very important. Kenya has a northern and coastal population that's Somali, that is Muslim, um, and distinctively look, they distinctively look Somali, as opposed to the rest of Kenyans who are largely Christian, um, except for staying on the coast down to, if you look at the bottom of that map, you'll see Mombasa. That's a, um, a Muslim city. The whole coast is, is Muslim. Um, but they are more Bantu Kenyans than, than the Somalis. Um, but they, the Somalis are poorer. The Kenyans worry about the security risks of the Somalis who come down from Somalia and try to integrate into the Somali communities living in Kenya. So they have tensions with Somalia whenever Somalia has a little bit of, of well, <laughs> the frequent times when they have a lot of conflict and refugees flow. Um, up in the north, the Somalis there, um, they have trading ties up into Saudi Arabia. So while there are not Saudis up into Saudi Arabia, um, sorry, up into Yemen and then going on into Saudi Arabia. Um, they export cattle, they have trading links. But sort of who are Somalis? They are diverse people, but they all share the same religion, the same language, and, and a clan structure that unites them. Um, some of the characteristics of this clan structure, many people will talk about the clans in Somalia the way that we talk about ethnic groups in the rest of Africa. They function um, pretty much in a similar way, so that the clans organize social interactions. But unlike tribes, and in the rest of Africa, tribes had, have chiefs, and the chiefs organize into regional chieftaincies, which organize into larger order chieftaincies, often organized through family ties or lineages or clans. So a tribe is within a clan, which is within an ethnic group. 
In Somalia, the clans have sub-clans. They are all lineage-based. There are no linguistic differences. There are no customary distinctions between them. There are some degrees of regional distinctiveness. And so if you look at the map that's in the upper left, it sort of paints where are the different Somali clans. Now, each of these main clans, the Deer, Rahanwain, Darud, Digil, Hawiye, Isak, um, have subclans within them. And those subclans are important because politics in Somalia runs at the subclan and in the sub sub clan level. As outsiders, most of us will never understand exactly how the, the clans and the sub clans function. We may be able to pop up nice, pretty charts that as outsiders we, we, we like, they make it comprehensible to us, but the way that the clans actually operate, this, this idea of decentralized autonomy, sorry, decentralized authority, autonomy, and fluidity are very important to how the clans operate because clans will align, dissolve, realign very quickly. Um, this is one of the things that got the United States into trouble in 1993 with the Black Hawk Down incident, was that we did not understand that with external backing uh, in Mogadishu of one warlord, immediately all the other warlords who previously had been fighting with that warlord, and we backed um, IDED, all the other warlord groups, just in Mogadishu itself, a small little city, would immediately ally against the one that the outsider had backed. So these, these, these ideas are fluid. The basic thing is the Somali family unit is, is the, sort of the organizing uh, principle, and then it goes out from there. And so the closer to the f nuclear family ties and, and then the, the small extended family a person is, the, the, the more um, cohesive are the relationships. Alliances will tend to work up and down subclans within a family clan. Darud versus Hawiye are the two main groups that have fought historically for control. But you will see Merhan versus Majertin, both within Darud clan, as some of the major, another set of major political rivalries. Um, and so thinking about that, now if you look at under the Hawiye clans, the Al Shabaab leaders uh, historically have come from the Ayer clans of, of the Gedir sub clans of Hawiye. Um, so you want to know about that, but you want somebody who's a genuine expert if you need to analyze and drill down who can really get you into uh, those dynamics. And in the United States, there are about three to five people who most experts would say really know their stuff uh, when we're talking about, about these clans. Um, so that, that's how hard it is to kind of get in there. The Somali language is a very difficult language to learn. OK, so when we talk about decentralized authority, why that's important is because traditionally Somalis do not recognize a king. They do not recognize a regional leader. So creating central authority, a central government, is traditionally difficult because it, it re involves them rethinking the way that they organize and, and interact with each other. Not that it is impossible for them to think that way, but just that it goes against the grain and you want to think about, about that. Because each of the clans and then the subclan groups and then the, the, the lineages within the subclan groups, they have substantial autonomy. Nobody tells them what to do. They basically are governed by this customary law, which is called shear. And shear operates on a principle of um, compensation, the dia fees. Dia are, is sort of the name of, of the, um, the, the, the dues that you pay for things like trade or um, if there is, is theft, you, you pay compensation. Traditionally, customary law or shear is what governs inter family, interlineate, inter subclan, and interclan relationships. And it's a well known code of behavior, conduct, and then uh, reaction when something goes wrong. Very different than, than Islamic law, which more recently has been laid over it. Strategically, um, there are regional, both within Somalia, country level, and then regional implications of th this clan substructure. The enemies of one subclan lineage are the enemies of the entire clan. And so allies are usually found across clan. Um, well, the cross clans are rivals, but they, uh, they, can, they will ally with each other. But these alliances shift pragmatically and, and constantly. Um, pragmatically meaning if, the, if a Somali group sees that it can gain advantage, commercial, political, um, other, 
through shifting its clan alliance, it will do that, and it will do it on a dime. Um, regionally, because the Somalis f flow and live in all these countries, instability in one country can very easily threaten instability in the entire region. So if Somalis start flooding down into Kenya, Kenya can develop its own problems in its northern provinces with, with refugee camps, with what to do with the populations, um, and, and how, to, how, to, how will they interact with the local Kenyan populations. If Somalia itself unites and becomes a strong country, then Ethiopia will worry that the Ogaden region will try to leave Ethiopia and join Somalia. There are tensions up into Eritrea, which unfortunately this map doesn't show you the country of Eritrea. But if you want to know where Eritrea is, basically look at the map, find where it says Tigray, um, all the way at the top of Ethiopia. And if you were to draw a line from the T to the I, and then kind of just down, paralleling the coast to Djibouti, that's where Eritrea is now. Um, Eritreans and Ethiopians have their own rivalries, which feed into the Somali conflict. The Eritreans like the idea of a united Somalia, and the Ethiopians do not. So st instabilities in Somalia can be caused by Ethio Ethiopia-Eritrea rivalries, or they can feed into them at various different times. Religiously, while the Somalis are all Muslims, um, they're Sunni Islam, unlike the Sufi variant that you find in, in West Africa which means they're one step closer to the type of Islam that you find throughout much of the Middle East. In Western Africa, the Sufism has become what we call syncretic, and it has merged in a, in a large uh, degree with local beliefs, and so it kind of diffuses its radicalization potential. Here, the Sunnism, or Sunnism sorry, um, is closer to uh, what a, a fundamentalist would call pure Islam, but it is not organized into brotherhoods, or doesn't have influence from the Muslim Brotherhood as Islam in Sudan does, for example. Um, but it's decentralized, the practice of Islam, similarly to the way that the clans work. Um, so Islamic radicalization did not happen until the 2000s. Um, and that was as a direct result of people coming home to Somalia, Somalia's coming home after having fought in Afghanistan. So traditionally, this is not an area that has had a lot of uh, political Islam. Understanding politically, then, what the background is, why Somalia has been so unstable, why it is so difficult for Somalia to actually create um, a, a, a stable government, um, is rooted in the civil war that basically started in 1988, uh, sorry, 1981 and lasted until the early 1990s. So during this period of civil war from 1981 onwards, much of the state's infrastructure that had been built up during uh, either colonial rule by either Britain or uh, Italy or France, France actually controlled the state that is now Djibouti, Britain controlled the area that is now Somali land in the north, and Italians controlled the southern parts of Somalia they all entered Somalia in the late 1800s, um, about 1888. Uh, there was a, an agreement between Britain and France that separated what is now Djibouti from Somalia. Um, and then Italy moved into southern um, Somalia in the 1920s. And during this colonial period, they, they, the colonial rulers built up different forms of infrastructure on the different territories. But all, almost all of this is destroyed in the conflicts that, are, that arise in the 1980s. Um, there is chronic displacement of, of people within Somalia, which leads to a set of unresolved claims about who owns land, who can use the land. Um, the southerners that live between the Juba and the Shabeli rivers are agriculturalists, and almost all of the rest of the population are nomads. They're pastoralists, which means they graze um, cattle, camels, goats, um, and there's always, in, in most of East Africa, there's traditional rivalries between settled groups and pastoral groups. And you get that in Somalia, but now this, this lays over with a history of civil war, not knowing how far back claims go or how to adjudicate claims. So grievances go unresolved. 
There's a history now of war warlordism, warlordism, excuse me. And in this, it's that the clans have armed themselves over time. Both, um, basically, Somalia became independent from its various colonial rulers in 1960. Uh, Somali land and Somalia became uh, independent separately, but within three days, they, they agreed to merge into the Republic of Somalia. Um, this is actually important because now, when Somali land claims that it's the Republic of Somaliland, it should be an independent country. It actually has a historical claim as a different colonial territory and having achieved independence in the, separately from the rest of Somalia and that it opted, it chose to join into one country. By the, by the Articles of the Organization of African Unity and now the Africa Union, Technically, it should be able to claim independent status, but for various reasons it does not. But this leads to sets of current tensions between, within there. But this is important because within northern Somalia, I mean, it's even important for understanding the background, basically the regionally focused, regionally concentrated clans develop militias um, in the 1980s as they're fighting against the government that had governed, uh, been elected in the early 1960s. So there are elections um, in the early 1960s that bring out a civilian government, but this government gets overthrown in a coup um, in 1969. So the country only had about nine years of civilian rule before Mohammed Sayyad Bari, a name that most of you are familiar with, assumed power um, after the elected head of state was assassinated. Now he then, between 1969 and 1991, Barre is the ruler of Somalia, and he rules through a system of clan patronage and balancing among the different clans. Um, but by the 1980s, when there's opposition to him, all of these clans arm themselves. This is the genesis of the warlordism that you see today in Somalia. Um, the fact that there are lots of spoilers in Somalia is another challenge to sort of the state collapse, civil war, and the politics of intervention. Um, the, the regional groupings, northern, north central, and southern, all have within them subgroupings, the clan groupings, um, and by the regional groupings, sorry, uh, that's a little bit out of context. We talk about there being Somaliland, Puntland, and Somalia, three distinct areas within Somalia. I'll get to those in a couple slides because there are maps that show what those differences are. Um, just knowing though that there are, each of these clan groups armed with the militia have had um, interests in various aspects of the peace process. And so some of them have liked different, different agreements more than others. Um, and if they don't like the agreements, they become what in, in the peace building literature we call a spoiler. It's a group that actively tries to, to, tries to subvert a peace process. So just remember that there's spoilers at every, every turn most, throughout these processes. There's small arms proliferation, especially after 1989 when uh, with the end of the Cold War, um, arms trades opened up and a lot of older weapons coming out of the former Soviet Union come down into Africa. Um, there is a history of failed peace conferences, suspicion of external mediation and intervention. Now this comes to, within the region, if Ethiopia backs a peace intervention, then the Eritreans think that there's a problem. Um, and, this, and several groups within Somalia are suspicious of Ethiopian ambitions. They think Ethiopia might want to control Somalia, might want to control the government. So as a regional player, Ethiopia is a slightly tainted in facilitating interventions. Kenya is less tainted, so, tainted sorry. so a lot of uh, peace mediations have taken place either in Kenya or in Djibouti. And Djibouti has a less stigmatized role as well. But none of the peace conferences have really stuck. So Somalia, and I'm just going to advance one slide, um, two slides. OK, coming back. Somalia basically um, had its independence from 60 to basic in 60. In 1969, there's an assassination that brings Siad Bari to, to be the government, uh, the, the head of government. Um, in 1970, Bari declares Somalia a socialist state. Now, this is important because when Bari declares Somalia a socialist state, 
what happens is that the Somalis now start looking east. In the global Cold War context, they start getting support from the Soviet Union, but their rival at the time, Ethiopia, starts getting backing from the United States. Um, but in 77, under Bari, Somalia invades the Somali-inhabited region of Ethiopia, trying to pull it back. They're trying to liberate their Somalis and bring them into greater Somalia. This sets the stage for tensions that go into the region until today. The Ethiopians are able to repel the Somali invasion um, only after Mengistu at that time brings in Soviet advisors and Cuban troops because the Ethiopians have their own change of administration. They throw out their emperor and they themselves bring in a socialist government, the Derg. Um, and the Derg is now more socialist than Bari, so they attract um, Eastern support from, from the Soviets and then far Western support from the Cubans. The US flips and now starts to support Somalia slightly, not enough to keep the Somalis, to enable them to win their, their, their bid to, to gain this territory from Ethiopia. Uh, one of my colleagues here at the Naval Postgraduate School likes to call it the big horn flip-flop. Um, she's got a great sense of humor. And the reason she says it as the big horn flip-flop is because you see a geostrategic switch from the US supporting Ethiopia to the USSR supporting Ethiopia, which causes the US to switch support to Somalia and withdraw it from Ethiopia. Flips like this are very characteristic of how the US supports supported, supposed allies in the Horn of Africa. And it very much influences the way that Somalis see US intervention. They don't actually expect the US to last for very long as soon as an ideological position that is taken by Somalis on the ground displeases the United States. And so there's a distrust that stems from this of intervention from the West, from the outside. Um, so when we talk about failed peace conferences in the 1990s and 2000s, where we're, they're trying to create a lasting peace in Somalia, and this la the lack of a peace is what prevents them from be being able to monitor their coastline and provide economic opportunity and jobs that is then what links into piracy. As you bring it back into where does this instability come from, it starts early on, but 77, uh, this, the invasion, is a critical turning point in, in all of this. Um, because now Ethiopia sort of is seen as an aggressor within Somalia. The Ethiopians now are no longer disinterested. So the Ethiopians are very interested in preventing another Ogaden war. They're very interested in keeping the Ogaden region within Ethiopia. They do not want the Ogadeni National Liberation Front, which is a current political movement, from trying to pull the territory over into Somalia. Um, and they do not want the Somalis to become united enough to be able to try to launch a movement to bring Ogaden home. Domestically within Somalia, this defeat um, between 77 and 78, when the Somali forces are expelled from the Ogaden region, it's embarrassing to Barre. He put a lot of effort and a lot of his own personal reputation into winning, and he almost won. He would have won that territory had the Soviets and the Cubans not bailed out the Ethiopians, which is ironic because today the Ethiopians are the strongest military in the region. Um, but between 78 and 81, because of this loss of face, Barre starts to have opposition. So his whole system of, of clan balancing between the different clans breaks down. And this is setting the stage for large-scale clan rivalries because now there's a central state. And a central state gets foreign assistance. It gets donations from other governments. It runs programs from uh, development agencies. So money and material resources and economic opportunities that are vested in the state, it matters who controls the state and then who has access to that. So as long as Barre was evenly doling out the spoils of the state to the different clans, there was relative peace. It may not have been a cohesive government the way that we're used to seeing in the West, but it worked. But with the defeat in 78, he starts now favoring certain clans. Barre starts favoring certain clans. He upsets the whole system on which his delicate balance is built. By 1981, um, armed opposition to Bari's regime is emerging because he's excluding members of the Majeritine 
and the Issac clans from government positions. And he puts in those positions people from his own Merhan clan. This is the beginning of clan, really centralized clan rivalries. So that f in throughout all the 1980s, there is now um, civil war in Somalia with the ousting of Bari in 1991. This sets off, the ousting of Bari sets off a very um, fierce power struggle between warlords uh, Muhammad Farah Aidid and Ali Mahdi Muhammad, um, which kills or wounds thousands of civilians. And in 1991 to 1992 to three, this is now finally when the United Nations decides it's going to try to um, create an intervention force. So you see UNISOM 1 being formed in April 1991. Um, it's basically taken over in December 1992 by UNITAF. Now, UNISOM was a multilateral UN-led peacekeeping mission, April 91 to December 92. In December 1992, the United States starts contributing mo the majority, if not most, of the troops, renames it UNITAF. It's now no longer a UN. It is UN, but it's a, a task force under US-led, uh, United States lead. Um, we call this, the United States citizens, call it Operation Restore Hope. So those of you who are familiar with that, you know that term. Operation Restore Hope runs between December 1992 and May 1993. Now this is critical for those of you who know about Black Hawk Down. In May 1993, the US is supposed to dial back its, its level of, of troops in Somalia and prepare for a transition to a second United Nations operation in Somalia, UNOSOM, UNOSOM II. UNISOM II starts in May 1993 and technically goes until May 1995. But May 1993 and then in October 1993, there's a lot of armed opposition to um, UNISOM II. That's actually when the US Rangers get trapped in Mogadishu and the incident that created the, movie, the book and then the movie Black Hawk Down, where they intentionally shot down a Black Hawk helicopter, knowing that in US Ranger culture, they don't leave people behind. So you shoot down a, a plane, uh, sorry, a helicopter, more are going to come. And so this is a strategy, more are going to come to extract those people. This is a strategy to try to invalidate the UN peacekeeping missions or the US-led peacekeeping missions and get them to leave. And it actually kind of works because by 1995, they leave. Um, that, that is a particular incident. For those of you who are more strategically minded and operationally focused, you might want to do some research on that um, because this is an incident where it, it becomes important that you know what the geography and, and sort of how things work in Somalia. Um, part of the problem that created the, the uh, attacks on the U.S. Rangers in Mogadishu in October 93 was that the helicopter that hovered while trying to drop them down, actually no, um, the helicopter that hovered while trying to extract them couldn't do it because within three seconds of hovering, it could not land and get the people out because it created a brownout from all the dust that's in Mogadishu. It was a dry part of the year. So though operationally, if you're trying to suggest in the war game various exit options or attack options or, or whatnot, or peace building options, you want to keep that in mind and, and do some research on um, the climate and, and that sort of thing. This is all speaking to this slide of failed peace conferences, suspicion of external mediation, international risk aversion, not domestic risk, risk aversion, but because of the failed UNISOM 1, UNITAF, UNISOM 2, the international community is slow to go into Somalia because they know that they get it wrong all the time. Um, interestingly, civil war starting in 1981, ouster of Bari in 91, um, by 1995, there was actually some sort of local governance. The clans had restored order within Mogadishu through clan structures, clan courts, clan militias, um, without having a central state. So Somali experts, some have said, well, maybe they don't need a centralized state. And there's an open debate there that's worth thinking about as to um, what does building a centralized state do for Somalia? Um, because many Somalis see state building as zero sum. Zero sum meaning only one group wins. It's not an ever expanding pie where everybody can gain a little piece of it. 
zero sum is there's a set pi, and if I get this slice, that means somebody else can't get this piece of the slice. And so there's really only so much that uh, can go around. State building is seen this way to many Somalis. Our gain is their loss. And if it's their loss, those who lose now fight. And this is part of the problem with the unstable transitional governments that have, uh, that have suffered in, in Somalia since then. Um, I'm going to go forward just because we're spending a little bit too long. Because um, what's interesting to bring us forward now into the current situation is the setting is, as we're thinking about Somalia today, the challenges of transitional government, the rise of the Islamic Courts Union in 2004 to 6 to 7, um, the rise of uh, piracy, and now the rise of al-Shabaab, is it is in the context of 19 years of state collapse. But state collapse doesn't mean governance collapse. Because the Somalis have a way of governing themselves at the local level. It just doesn't look like a state. And that's important. Um, it doesn't mean chaos if there's no central government. When there's fighting, obviously, you get disruptions of civilian populations. And that does lead to some degree of, of chaos. But throughout, in the 19, late 1990s, Mogadishu started to revive. It started to get businesses back. It had telecoms. It had banking. Um, this was mostly destroyed again in the mid-2000s when the U.S. backed an Ethiopian invasion. They do have a way of working things out. I am not advocating either direction, state, no state. I'm just saying it's an open question that, that is worth thinking about. Um, the political situation today, then, is sort of in this context of armed conflict, state collapse, and then the rise and fall of the Islamic Courts Union focused in 2006. Um, so I'm going to jump to this slide and then come back to the previous one. Explaining the rise of the Islamists, um, kind of you want to bring it back to 1995, but it's basically the short version, and again, you could do research on your own about this, is that when the central government uh, basically disintegrates or is, is torn apart, the local clan-based uh, uh, groups still have their shear. They still have local uh, systems. The rule of law was basically um, provided through local uh, clans and their shear system. Sometime in the 1990s, some of the clans start creating clan-based Sharia courts. So instead of shear, the, the traditional Somali law, they're starting to implement Sharia, the Islamic law. But what's important, until um, sometime between 2003 and 2006, is that if there is ever a conflict between Sharia and Shia, meaning if Sharia says there's been a theft, you need to take some kind of corporal punishment, Shia says, oh no, you need to pay money to make up for what was stolen, and Shia would win out. So the really restrictive and harsh punishments of Sharia were never implemented in Somalia. So it wasn't that kind of, 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 of Islamic court. It was a kind of a merger of the two. But throughout this time, we've got the rule of law provided through either Shia-based or Sharia-based courts. Islamic charities are providing social services, support for widows, school fees, school textbooks, health services, all those types of things. Um, but then by 1998, there's an umbrella movement that seeks to create cooperation across the courts. And Hassan Dahir Awais, was the leader of that. And this is what creates the Islamic Courts Union starting in 1998. Now what's important is Islamic Courts Union was, folk, was centered in Mogadishu, which had between 11 or 12 um, clan courts, which basically had divided the city into quadrants or, or clan, uh, sorry, sectors. And each sector was ruled by a different clan, different clan court system, and different militia. This made moving between the different sectors uh, complicated. So they agreed to have a common operating framework. This creates the Islamic Courts Union. The Islamic Courts Union, out of the uh, about 11, I think it was, clan courts, only two of them were slightly radical, the one uh, by Hassan Dahir Awais, and then another by IRO, um, AY, comma, apostrophe, RO is how you often see um, that person's name written in, when it gets written down into our script. Um, and so they, they were both fraternities from Afghanistan. 
um, had fought with the Mujahideen, had come back Som to Somalia with a more radicalized interpretation of Islam. There are debates to today as to how much of the ICU, Islamic Courts Union, had really come over to the radicalism of Awais and RO, and how much of it was still the more moderate version of Shia. And, um, and, and to, uh, there's no clear answer to that. Um, but the ICU starts to control Mogadishu, imposes peace and law and order, and it gains control over much of Somalia between 2003 to 2006. Now they create their own Mujahideen militia, Shabab, which in Somali means the youth. Now Shabab is a militia subservient to the ICU. It is controlled by the ICU. It provides safe haven though to several members of the East African Al-Qaeda cell. And the East African Al-Qaeda cell is actually formed in, uh, in Kenya, the most law-abiding country in the region. Itself not so law-abiding by Western standards, but it has a larger degree of law and order than certainly Somalia does, or even southern Sudan, uh, which is having a civil war, which by this point is ending, but um, with the north. By 2005, the ICU is the most powerful movement in Somalia, but it was always this loose coalition of movement between moderates and hardliners. So to say that the ICU was hijacked by al-Qaeda extremists is a little bit of an exaggeration. But there were elements of al-Qaeda support in there. Like any movement, it's, it's got multiple, uh, multiple strains. And so you, to look at this map of, of territory, um, there are, and Supreme Islamic Courts Council is, is one of the acronyms that sort of has been also used for Islamic courts. Um, there's basically different types of control in different parts of Somali territory in, in this, this time frame. The northern part of the region is Somaliland. It's running its own government, its own judiciary, its own courts, rule of law, currency. Puntland is doing much of the same. But in the southern part of the country, there's either this struggling transitional government, which by 2006 is a transitional federal government, but in the early 2000s is a transitional national government, and it can't really exert any control outside of Mogadishu. So the Islamic Courts Union actually becomes kind of the first centralized, large-scale government in southern Somalia in two decades by this point. Um, but the problem is that because of this loose coalition of moderates and hardliners, modliners is not actually a word, even if I might want it to be one, um, this coalition of moderates and hardliners, in the context of the post-9-11 global war on terror and the strategic position of Somalia, you know, like, uh, going the wrong way, uh, looking, you know, this one doesn't give it to you, but it's uh, into the Red Sea, the United States is worried about what it means to have an Islamic government. Um, and so there, there's some backgrounds there. I'm gonna shift a little bit and then come back to what ended the ICU. Because this is again, this is a, the context of why Somalis are so desperate that they turn to piracy. Um, the transitional governments that the international community had tried to create, between 2000 and 2004, there was something called transitional national government. It, said it was going to rule one Somalia as a one unitary state. It was never really able to gain entrance into Somalia and to create a government. Um, by 2004, its mandate had run out and it was replaced with something called the tr transitional federal government. And both of these um, have origins in peace conferences. The Ethiopian government opposed the transitional national government because of the national part of it. The Ethiopian government worried that a united Somalia would seek to gain the Ogaden. So the Ethiopians didn't really help the TF, TNG. But the Ethiopians really liked the traditional federal government, which started after 2004. The ICU is challenging, the, was challenging, the transitional federal government. Ethiopian, in their logic, um, a divided Somalia, a federated Somalia, won't be unified enough to try to gain the Ogaden and bring it back into Somalia itself. So there, there's some of those geostrategic within the region uh, reasons for different levels of support. 
But the Somalis, they know that the Ethiopians like the TFG. But they also feel like the TFG has nothing for them. The TFG um, cannot leave Kenya. It's having a lot of trouble finding a place in, in Somalia where it can actually govern. At, on a good day, it governs a third of Mogadishu, maybe a half. And on a bad day, none of it. And so basically, the Somalis see, to them, on the ground, the Islamic Courts Union creating the first cohesive, peaceful government that they've had. But then um, the Ethiopians come in and overrun it in 2006 to 7, backed by the United States. And this gets to some of their aversion to international interventions. Because the US backs an Ethiopian invasion of Somalia under the Islamic Courts Union, which basically shatters the political cells of the ICU, but the, they, they escape into Kenya, to the military cells, leads to an insurgency throughout much of Somalia in 2007 to 2008. And now this insurgency is popularly backed because it's al-Shabaab, it's the youth, now divorced from the moderating influence of the Islamic Courts Union because they've been destroyed, the, the Courts Union has been destroyed by the Ethiopian invasion. Um, so this basically sparks this insurgence of militias, clan resistance, and the rehatting of opposition to the TFG under this insurgency that is now opposing Ethiopian rule, which is what they see it as, Ethiopians in Somalia throughout 2007. Um, they want to prevent the TFG from governing. They see it as a stooge of Ethiopia. The insurgents want to get Ethiopia out of the country. Um, they merge nationalist, Islamist, anti-Ethiopian, anti-imperialist, anti-Western sentiments. So it kind of the rhetoric goes like, like this. It's the US has supported an Ethiopian invasion which destroyed the only national government we had been able to create after 20 years of civil war. We're finally getting our act together it's under Islam, which we're all Muslim, so we feel this is an appropriate government. But the West, because of its global war on terror, cannot allow us to have a government that is organic, that is not imposed by them, because they feel the TFG is imposed by the West. Um, and they're trying to push out this, this imperialism, the, the neocolonialism that they see the traditional federal government as. So there's a lot that goes into this insurgency. Um, this is what creates al-Shabaab. Uh, this is what al-Shabaab, well not creates, but it creates the modern incarnation of al-Shabaab because it was formed out of the clan militias. But this is what gives it impetus, this is what gets it recruits. When people then talk about the overlaps potential between al-Shabaab and pirates, it comes out of, of this, this phase. Um, I'm just going to go a little bit forward because it's probably time to really focus on piracy. Um, we're going to, that's the political situation. Thinking about piracy then, piracy comes out of all this. I know it seems odd to spend however long I've just spent talking about politics in Somalia and then to say, but this is how we talk about piracy. But it's because we want to, you to think about where do pirates come from, who are the pirates, what are their motivations? Now, the original source of piracy was fishermen in the early 1990s. Governments control the territorial waters, right? Governments prevent, and government navies or coast guards, prevent illegal fishing in their waters. A country that has not had a government since the mid-1980s has had no Coast Guard, no Navy, no national army even, is clearly not patrolling its waters. So by the early 1990s, commercially uh, aggressive uh, fishing vessels, and I've always been told mostly from China and Korea, um, have started fishing in the Somali territorial waters. And because there's no enforcement of fishing quotas, they're overfishing. So the Somali fishermen are seeing their catches dwindle. Now they stay close to shore because they have relatively uh, unsophisticated technologies in their fishing vessels, net fishing mostly, but local net fishing. But still they're seeing their catches decline. They have no central government to protect them. They have no vibrant local economy that they can uh, interact with for an alternate source of income from fishing. And their fishing stocks are dwindling because of foreign trawlers, and they know that that's where it's coming from. So 
you start seeing pirates who now start to attack some of the commercial fishing vessels. That's the first pirates. They're self-defense. They're defending Somalia's national waters, the economic interests of, of the fishermen. Um, but over time, it changes as all things do, and it grows. They realize that they don't have to just attack commercial fishing, fishing vessels. They can take them over and demand ransom. And they discover that ransoms get paid, get paid quickly, and get paid quietly, because fishing companies, and as they get more ambitious, uh, shipping companies, they don't want to attract attention. They just want to pay a ransom, factor it into the business model, and go on their way. Um, so piracy stays relatively low level, uh, sort of restricted to the fishing vessels, until around 2000, 2001, when the continued instability in Somalia and the slow realization that there is some kind of economic gain to be made from this ransom business, it, it increases the pace, increases the sophistication, and increases the number of people going into piracy. Um, now, piracy, it, it's, its sort of seasonal variations are affected by the monsoons. So there's a southwest monsoon season, um, the Somalia low-level jet. These are things that those of you who are nautically minded want to go and, and do more research on. That runs from the end of May through August high winds and gusts, lots of fog and mist, and the large upswellings basically tend to keep local fishers on shore and the smaller fishing vessels that are commercial away from, from the coasts. So naturally, piracy tends to um, slow down between May and August. It'll increase then from August to December when there's the northeast monsoon season, and then again, it all subsides between December to March because it's just not as safe to be there. Um, so when you read about the Islamic Courts Union having stopped all piracy during the six months that it actually controlled southern Somalia, there are some who, and, and that's a strong argument in the piracy uh, field, um, there are just as many others who say it wasn't that the ICU thought that it was not uh, proper Islamic code to steal other people's uh, goods, which basically is what pirates do, um, and so it stopped them. No, it was the monsoon season that stopped them. And so, again, that's another open question for you guys to think about. Piracy trends and key developments since the late 1990s is basically we see a shift from targeting cargo ships and yachts um, strictly for ransom. So a move away from the protection of the coast, protection of fishing, the ch a change in the type of vessels that they go after. So moving from fishing vessels to cargo ships, because cargo ships are very valuable and the ransoms that are paid are higher. Uh, same thing with pleasure yachts. Um, families will pay to get their loved ones home safely and soundly, despite the fact that very recently there have been a couple of high profile incidents of where the uh, hostages have been killed. Um, and if you do a little bit of research on that, you can open up a debate as to whether the Somalis killed the hostages because they wanted to or because they were afraid of an interdiction force that was actually about to storm and, and uh, take. This is one incident with Americans, two Americans who were recently uh, killed. Um, but along with this, there's a spike in ransoms, a spike in the ransoms that are demanded and which are paid out because as the, um, the ships get worth... Uh, the booty gets, gets worth more, so does the ransom. Um, interestingly, though, we see the, now the involvement of top political and economic figures by the late 1990s and into the 2000s, and really into the late 2000s, the first decade of the 2000s. Um, there's been the implication of leaders in Puntland, leaders in the far south, Puntland being the far north, and Puntland is part of the far south. Um, becoming, providing safe haven to pirates, the creation of pirate towns, which are thought to operate similar to narco towns in West Africa, narco towns in West Africa. Um, so there's a bit of collaboration between political figures and, and pirates. They're starting to use new technologies, the use of satellite phones, thoria phones, of GPS. This extends their reach. Now this is significant because African navies are slightly notorious for being relatively technologically undersourced. 
So if you're, if you're used to thinking about West Africa and you know that several of the Coast Guards in the West African countries don't even have GPS on their ships. Now they may have increased in the last year since I've tracked this, but historically they have to stay within sight of land. You've got pirates over on the eastern coast of Africa who have more advanced technologies than the navies of the west coast of Africa. There's a little bit of an imbalance here. But the new technologies allow them to leave sight of land and to go after higher order uh, vessels. They coordinate between themselves on the satellite phones. So you have coordinated attacks. They have put spies at the seaport, so they call pirates up and down the coast, the spies in the seaport saying, hey, a ship just moored, it just left, it's got this and this goods, it's owned by such and such a company, they pay off and go after them. So you see, you see more sophistication. It's becoming an economy. There's no domestic land-based economy. So it's a sea-based economy. It's a sea-based economy that is reliable, it is easy to escape detection because of the vast geography of this coastline. They rely on lots of young local Somalis who want to spend a couple months to a year or two being pirates, get a lot of money, and go home and try to start a business. So it's not that anybody becomes a permanent pirate, it's kind of a revolving door. So if you're thinking about restricting the supply of pirates as one of your anti-piracy campaigns, think about that aspect of it economically viable, productive, the, the land-based options are still very restricted because of lack of, of control and productive economies. Um, it's a short-term way to gain a lot of money, go back home, and try to start a local business. And it's a rotational workforce. Um, they start using these captured motherships. And the motherships are captured vessels that they use as floating platforms. And smaller pirate vessels moor up with the mothership and launch attacks from the mothership. So you start to see in the late 2000s a separation. The, the piracy is no longer confined to launching attacks from land. They now launch attacks from sea and the attacks go back to sea. So they can do more sustained attacks, more coordinated attacks, farther out to sea attacks, attacking bigger vessels with more lucrative uh, which is why you start to see these flags, right? Uh, if you're looking at this map over here, these flags are getting farther and farther out to sea as time goes on. Um, wrong way, apologies for that. Um, they move into the Gulf of Aden. They're starting to coordinate across clan. Hey, if, if we keep on saying that we want to see United Somalia, we're actually seeing it. We're just not seeing it in the way we wanted to or we thought we would. Um, Cross-clan operations provide flexibility. They merge the north and the south. Somalia can cooperate when it wants to. Return to my earlier statements about pragmatism. Um, there's something in it for them. Um, and there's some evidence, and this is the most disheartening trend, that some of the pirates are former Coast Guard or were recently trained by private security firms. This is important because by the late 2000s, the US is going in and trying to create a Coast Guard for Somalia so that we try to create a Somali-led way to combat piracy, right? You need a brown water capability in order to, to be able to patrol the littoral waters and, and the, the coastal waters. So we spent money um, paying companies or doing it ourselves. There's been many hardworking U.S. Coast Guard service people um, who have tried to train Coast Guards in Yemen and in Somalia, um, but they can't control how these people are used after the training ends. And some of them have found their way into running pirate operations. Tactically, what do they do then, speaking of their operations? They have small boats. They use light weapons um, and small cells. They operate somewhat independently, but they also then coordinate through the motherships. Um, East African DAOs, D-H-O-U-S is a common spelling. Traditionally, just go up and down the eastern coast, small fishing vessels, um, small trading vessels that thousands of them every day. And the Somali pirates can kind of hide out, and they used to be able to hide out in these dows. And then they'd, they'd launch attacks. So this is the upper left-hand picture is a pirate on a captured vessel. Um, most of these pirates are not organized military. They're young gunmen. They operate in gangs or cells. Um, they always has, have one, at least, who knows how ships work. The rest don't need to. They just need to be the muscle. Um, they have the fighting trawler or a dow as a mother ship. 
and they use the mother ships to approach the cargo ships. It takes them 15 minutes to go ship to ship. That's very fast. I want to focus on that 15 minutes ship to ship to launch an attack from a, a, from a mother ship to a vessel that they're trying to uh, attack. Think about the task force that's spread throughout that really long coastal waterway from Maine to Tallahassee. To, you know, obviously, that's not Maine to Tallahassee, but bear with me here. Um, if they're thinly spread, can they respond in 15 minutes? The pirates can. So a sea-based solution has to be able to have a thick enough presence in the waters to be able to, if they want to stop a hijacking, reacting to it after it takes place is a whole other issue. But stopping the hijacking requires being able to be on scene probably within 10 minutes to be able to prevent the pirates from taking it over. 10 minutes is your operational window. After that, you're dealing with a hostage situation. Right? They are willing to fire on vessels. You'll see sensational stories early on about firing on a British cruise liner and how the RPG goes straight through the cruise liner. And they actually, in that instance, a long time ago, fended off the attacks. Um, but they basically, they board vessels. If, you know, they're not Jack Sparrow. They're not you know, that kind of, well, if you want to call them suave, sure. Um, but they're using rocket-propelled grappling hooks. They're getting on. They've got their guns. They take it over. In the past, they would just corral the crews. Remember, cargo ships have very small crews. Uh, yachts, again, depends on how you know many people. Uh, cruise vessels have a lot of people, so cruise vessels are actually the most difficult ones for them to go after. But a cargo ship is pretty easy to control once you capture the, the small crew. And they'll often sort of get the captain to go to the pirate cove. Um, they make a lot of unsuccessful attempts, but hey, they just keep on trying and the odds are in their favor. In the past, they would treat the hostages well, they demand their ransom, get their ransom, and let them go. Um, one of the debates that comes with the, the, the task forces that are attacking the pirate-held vessels is, is the attacks on pirate-held vessels creating an escalation in the pirates' own uh, their own degree of force that they use and their willingness to kill hostages um, and to otherwise be much more, more violent in their attacks. Um, they will hold crews for months, they, which actually is really interesting. Holding crews on ships for several months actually allows the Somali pirates to then create a catering business where they bring food and water from local pirate towns or local suppliers who sell them water, food, that they then bring to the, the captured crews. And they negotiate with the owners of the, the ships through cell phones. They start really high, and then they often come down to about one million, which they want in US dollars in bundles of $100 bills. Somalia runs on a cash economy. It transferred to a bank really just won't work. Um, the money gets delivered to the ship, it's counted, and then they release everybody. Um, they don't make political demands, right? This is important. They're not an Islamic organization trying to demand a free Somalia. They're not saying, if you kick out the Ethiopians, we'll stop being pirates. Um, they don't loot the ship contents. They don't steal the ship. They just want to get the ransom. And so there's a, it's an interesting dynamic that goes on. It really shows you the economic underpinnings of this. It's a business. Um, and there's just a little a snapshot in April 2009 that you've probably already read. So who's involved in piracy? Because if you want to stop piracy, you want to know who's, 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 who's there. Um, it's a full-fledged economy. Tens of millions of dollars annually. Um, and this is important. If you compare it to all Somali livestock exports earning around um, just 100, I think that's 10 million per year, pardon the typo. Um, tens of millions of dollars um, from, from uh, the, the pirate economy. Um, they distribute the ransom money. They create their own patronage networks in traditional old African politics terms. They go to business packers. These then buy, the business backers then buy them equipment. They pay off top political figures. Um, and possibly even the Somali diaspora spread throughout the world. Um, 
Puntland figures very heavily in a lot of these, these business networks. And the former TFG president, Yusuf, was from Puntland. Um, it's only about a thousand armed men who are former fishermen, gunmen, and technical es experts that are actively involved. But again, this is a rotating force. So it's a relatively small labor pool creating a large revenue stream. Um, not political, no evidence of al-Shabaab um, being involved. Um, but interestingly, and this may be a key to think about exploiting, is that the funds of ransom are not really going back into the local economies. Some of it is in terms of the, the local catering and the, the individual pirates who go back home and create businesses. But a lot of the, the large scale earnings are going into the port of Bosaso, up into Dubai and, and getting saved in accounts offshore by the pirate leaders. Um, and some people worry that Northeast Somalia is becoming a piracy version of a narco state. Um, the government in Puntland talks a good talk about combating piracy, but it's something to investigate as you're getting into your scenarios. Um, so it's possible that sort of local um, reactions to piracy, if they're not seeing any economic gain, could be a way in for creating local lack of support. What's the impact of piracy? Um, and again, this is now moving a little bit away from understanding the drivers of piracy, where it came from, what it's responding to, what its internal incentives are, are um, sort of, it's why the international community cares is it's just within Somalia. If you're thinking three regions, Somalia, regional, international, right? When we're thinking of how to understand piracy, it's both its genesis, its impact, and then responding. It's probably useful to think at different levels, national level, regional level, meaning East Africa region, and international level, meaning United Nations, combined joint task forces, or combined task forces, um, you know, CTF, the, the piracy, uh, anti-piracy task forces. In Somalia, now piracy disrupts food and aid shipments, reference back to over 20 years of political and economic instability, endemic or just protracted humanitarian crises, famine, drought, um, food aid has become very important to millions of Somalis. Um, when a World Health Organization ship or a world food uh, shipment gets hijacked, that's pretty critical. And those have started happening. Disruption of local trade and local fishing. fishing. So the movement started with fisher, fishermen, but is now hurting the fishermen. It's a, ironic, full circle. Um, it's now enriching warlords and creating a potential narco state in Puntland. It's, it's, it's no longer a popular uprising, if you want to look at it that way, the piracy. It's created its own high level within Somalia economy. Regionally, it's disrupting trade for Kenya, Tanzania, up into the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden states. Um, you're going through the Suez Canal is a lot more dangerous now and coming through the Straits of Bab el-Mandeb. Um, Commercial, commercial routes could be affected. Um, it's likely to de delay energy exploration in the Gulf of Aden. If you're an environmentalist, that's an unmitigated good thing. If you're not, if you're worried about the world's oil supply, that's something to worry about. So pros and cons, for, actually, if you want to think of it that way. Internationally now, on the largest scale, disrupting one of the world's busiest shipping lanes, like I said, Suez, Straits of Baba Mandeb, that shortcut through the Med, rather than having to go all the way around uh, Africa, which means, ironically, maybe South Africa, and I'm not saying they do, but maybe South Africa actually likes some degree of the piracy if it's pushing more vessels to go around the Cape of Good Hope so that Durban, which is actually the most, the busiest port in all of Africa, maybe Durban and Cape Town are seeing uh, more, more shipping come through because uh, vessels are avoiding uh, the eastern seaboard. Um, what, what U.S. analysts and others worry about is potential trends for the purely economic activity to evolve into a terrorist-aligned operation. I haven't seen it, and, I, and the, the people that I work with who, who know a lot about this haven't been talking about this as a genuine concern now, but it is one that you can think about. Maybe they will. Um, and is this going to create copycat piracy elsewhere? Right, Southeast Asia in sort of... Um, the Malacca Straits, they successfully combated piracy. 
the area governments all cracked down on land and did some degree of cooperation at, in the sea level, but they have stopped it. What if this provides impetus for, for local uh, enterprising fishermen there or, or pirates there? Are we going to see copycats off of West Africa, right? We don't really know. And apparently that's the end of my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it.